Welcome to the third session of the Commission of Inquiry for Cambodia. My name is Louisa Coan Griva, and I'm a member of the Commission of Inquiry. To start our rule of law session today, we want to provide you with a short summary of the work of the Commission so far, so you will understand what has taken place and how it leads up to today's meeting, which is focused on rule of law issues. The idea for the Commission of Inquiry for Cambodia came from a meeting convened in July 2021 with approximately 50 Khmer groups and leaders led by Brad Adams, Asia Director of Human Rights Watch. At that meeting, which was designed as an information sharing and strategic planning webinar, Brad Adams suggested that past efforts had not produced what he referred to as effective, systematic, and meaningful improvements. He challenged the Khmer community to come up with new and more creative approaches. The commission was established by the Khmer community with that in mind. Based on models for this kind of independent fact-finding body used by the United Nations uh, for commissions of inquiry for Burma, Myanmar, and Syria. It has brought together some of the best minds and most experienced Cambodia and human rights experts to work together to promote more effective observance of democracy and human rights standards for Cambodia and for the Khmer people. The Commission's launch session took place on October 23rd, 2021. This date was chosen to co coincide with and give prominent attention to the commemoration of the 30th anniversary of the adoption of the Paris Peace Accords in 1991. Because the Accords incorporated core democracy and human rights standards that were intended to guide the newly created government of Cambodia. The Prime Minister at the time, Hun Sen, himself signed the Accords, Accords and agreed to the internationally established democracy and human rights standards that they contained. The first session of our Commission of Inquiry identified the issues to be given priority attention and outlined the proposed schedule of hearings. It also stressed the importance of including victims' testimonies, and it highlighted the cases uh, involving the assassinations of Kem Le, Chia Vichia, and Chut Buti. The session, Commission's second session took place on March 4th, 2022. This date was chosen to coincide with the convening of a special compliance review session on Cambodia by the United Nations Human Rights Council. The Commission decided to hold its session concurrently with the United Nations Cambodia hearing, recognizing that no single agency or platform could produce meaningful change by itself. Effective reform of major human rights systematic problems requires many voices and many platforms to act in concert on a more coordinated basis. The purpose is to bring international attention to the point of what we might call critical mass, the critical mass that is necessary to encourage and support effective remedial action. The Commission has submitted several official statements to the UN for consideration, in concluding a proposed list of issues and a summary of the Commission's interim findings and recommendations. This second session on, on March 4th was also used to announce the launching of the Khmer Urgent Action Network as an important symbol of the direct, active, and more energized involvement by the Khmer community itself in these monitoring efforts. The campaign is designed to follow the highly successful Amnesty International philosophy of promoting human rights observance by, quote, shining a powerful spotlight, unquote, on major abuses, and also speaking truth to power 
in a strong community-based voice. Every candle that is lighted by each member of the community on particular cases and issues of concern through their letters of concern and protest adds to the strength of that light that is being shined on major cases and abuses needing urgent attention and action. Just before the commission's special session in March was convened, something especially noteworthy took place. A French criminal court issued a decision finding probable cause to hold two of Hun Sen's top generals criminally responsible. These are the heads of his personal bodyguard unit for the 1997 grenade attacks on an opposition political rally that killed 16 participants and injured over 100 more. The only reason that Hun Sen himself was not named and criminally charged as well was that he enjoys, quote, head of state immunity, unquote, while he serves as prime minister. This French court decision is of major importance. It proves that Hun Sen and his colleagues cannot expect to enjoy impunity from being held responsible for their major human rights abuses. Along with the United Nations March hearings and actions by other international voices and platforms, the French court decision shows that meaningful progress is being made in the direction of justice and accountability for Cambodia and the Khmer people. And this brings us to today's session on rule of law being held by the Commission of Inquiry for Cambodia. At the United Nations hearings in March, the head of the Hun Sen government delegation attended, in, attempted to claim that the government was justified in having its courts declare that the opposition political party is illegal and justified in initiating criminal prosecutions against hundreds of its leaders and members. The chair and members of the Human Rights Review Group rejected that claim outright. They pointed out that the rule of law requires more than just invoking statutes and courts as a basis for harshly abusive policies that violate international human rights and democracy standards. The members made clear that the Hun Sen government was improperly misusing the law as, quote, a smokescreen to try to justify its abuses and to eliminate and punish criticism and meaningful political opposition in order to remain in power. The Commission of Inquiry for Cambodia is convening this rule of law session today to help, help explain what the rule of law actually requires and what the Hun Sen government has been doing that does not conform to these international standards. Why the United Nations Human Rights Committee was correct in its finding that the human, Hun Sen government closing down political opposition party, why the arrest and imprisonment of the party members and leaders, along with other critics of the government and representative of the independent media, why all these things violate international law and why these abuses must end. First, we'll start with a short uh, narration uh, explaining what the rule of law of session will cover, why the rule of law principle is important, uh, who will be testifying, and what they will be testing, testifying about. Hello, my name is Kingsley Abbott, and I am the Director of Global Accountability and International Justice with the International Commission of Jurists, known as the ICJ. I have been living in and working on human rights and the rule of law in Cambodia since 2007. The International Commission of Jurists is an international NGO based in Geneva with offices all over the world. And the ICJ has been working to promote and protect human rights and the rule of law since 1952. I'd like to begin by saying I'm really delighted and honored to be part of this Commission of Inquiry on Cambodia. 
And today I will be talking about the situation of the rule of law in the country. Cambodia is in the grip of an increasingly entrenched rule of law crisis that has widely permeated the political and legal landscape in the country. The recent mass convictions of at least 51 opposition and human rights defenders in June 2022 is a clear testament to this rule of law crisis. Let's begin by talking a little bit about what the rule of law is. The rule of law as pronounced in the International Commission of Jurists 1959 Declaration of Delhi and reaffirmed in the 2018 Tunis Declaration on reinforcing the rule of law and human rights is a dynamic concept. And it's a dynamic concept for the expansion and fulfillment of which jurists are primarily responsible and which should be employed to safeguard and advance human rights. It is not just a technical instrument of governance. It is a normative concept consisting of principles and correlative standards and subject to progressive development. The rule of law is inextricably linked to and interdependent with the protection of human rights as guaranteed in international law. There can be no full realization of human rights without the operation of the rule of law, just as there can be no fully operational rule of law that does not accord with international human rights law and standards. This conception of the rule of law is reflected in global standards, such as the UN Human Rights Council Resolution 36 bar 12 on human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. Some of the key principles that comprise the rule of law include the protection of human rights and the separation of powers and governance, presence of a pluralistic system of political parties and organizations, the independence of judges and lawyers, the right to a fair trial by a competent, independent, and impartial tribunal established by law, the principle of legality and legal certainty, including that law must be stated with clarity and intelligible to those whom it concerns, the functioning of a free, independent, and pluralistic media, and the principle of accountability and intolerance of impunity, particularly for serious crimes under international law, among other things. Unfortunately, these principles are absent in Cambodia. The very notion of the rule of law is frequently misused by the government in Cambodia. When members of the diplomatic community and senior UN officials have met with government officials to express their concern at the increasing misuse of the law in the country, they often received a legal lecture on the importance of the rule of law. But what is happening in Cambodia is the precise opposite of the rule of law which is very different to rule by law. The ICJ will highlight three interlinked facets underscoring or emphasizing how the rule of law has been repeatedly undermined in recent years. First, the absence of the independence and accountability of justice actors. Second, the impunity enjoyed by perpetrators of gross human rights violations and the lack of effective remedies for victims and their families. And third, the shrinking of civic space, especially in the digital sphere, through laws that are patently incompatible with international human rights law and standards. In 2017, the International Commission of Jurists produced a report in which we found that the single largest problem facing the Cambodian justice system is the lack of independent and impartial judges and prosecutors. The problem is twofold. An endemic system of political interference in high profile cases and an equally entrenched system of corruption in all others. Only in very limited instances at the local level where lawyers have direct and informal access to judges are cases potentially decided on the merits. And even if such instances, the outcome is often the result of behind the scenes negotiation. 
Simply put, the rule of law is virtually absent from the Cambodian justice system. Five years later, this observation still rings true. Most recently, following its review of Cambodia's compliance with the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Human Rights Committee registered its concern about the persistent lack of an independent and impartial judiciary and about the high number of allegations of corruption within the judiciary. And this is in spite of the measures that Cambodia has taken to strengthen the independence of the judiciary over the years. The committee also noticed, sorry, the committee also noted during the review process how some judges, prosecutors, and court staff were openly members of the ruling party, and that courts were the weapon of choice for the ruling party in its continued targeting of its perceived opponents. For example, the president of the Supreme Court, Justice Dit Munti, who presided over the November 2017 dissolution of the main opposition party, the CNRP, is reportedly a member of the ruling Cambodian People's Party, the CPP, and sits on both its standing and permanent committees. The separation of powers, particularly between the judiciary and the political branches of the government, is a core part of the rule of law. A competent, independent and impartial judiciary is fundamental to the rule of law, particularly in respect of the administration of justice and for the effective legal protection of human rights. It is therefore essential both to the rule of law more generally and specifically to the fulfillment of a state's international legal obligations on human rights, that the independence, impartiality, integrity, and competence of its courts and its judges are guaranteed in law and secured in practice. As set out in the UN Basic Principles on the Independence of the Judiciary, it's a core tenant of judicial independence that the judiciary shall decide matters before them impartially on the basis of facts and, a, and in accordance with the law, without any restrictions, improper influences, inducements, pressures, threats, or interferences, direct or indirect, from any quarter or for any reason. In its 2017 report, the International Commission of Jurists noted that the problem of judicial independence has long been rooted in corrupt influence, both political and financial, which appears to be exerted at will over all judicial activities. A study by the International Bar Association has noted how trainee judges are asked for bribes in order to enter into professional training, and those judges who are members of the CPP are favored for appointments and promotions. It is widely acknowledged that the court decisions are dictated by financial and political pressures on judges. Cases in which the authorities have an interest are consistently resolved in their favor, and in other cases, the party able to offer the largest bribe to a judge or clerk will almost certainly win the case, regardless of the merits. Unfortunately, the Human Rights Committee's observations in March 2022 on the corruption endemic within the judiciary reflects the sad reality that this deep-rooted problem is still persistent. Despite formal guarantees in domestic law and stated commitments to adhere to international standards, in reality, the de facto lack of an independent and impartial judicial system remains one of Cambodia's central and enduring rule of law and human rights issues. For instance, the Cambodian government has asserted recently during its review by the Human Rights Committee that the independence of the judiciary was guaranteed and safeguarded by the constitution and three laws. The law on the organization of the courts, the law on the status of judges and prosecutors, and the law on the organization and functioning of the Supreme Council of the Magistracy. The ICJ has called for a thorough review of the laws and proper consultation with the public and civil society, with a view to revising the drafts to ensure they are in accordance with international standards, in particular the separation of powers. Unfortunately, there was ultimately no consultation, 
and opposition lawmakers vowed in vain to seek amendments. Until this date, these flawed laws that are inconsistent with international law and standards remain on the books. Further, there is an absence of judicial and prosecutorial accountability, a lack of adherence to basic fair trial standards. Cambodian lawyers face constant and consistent hurdles in their practice before the domestic court system. For example, at the investigation stage, case files are almost exclusively shaped by prosecutors and are difficult for defense lawyers to access. And decisions of investigating judges contain little or no analysis based on the evidence. There is a high reliance on confessions in court, and it is common practice for the police to use various means of torture, other ill treatment and coercion to extract statements. In cases involving political opponents and human rights defenders, there is always a presumption of guilt. In trials observed by the International Commission of Jurists, defendants were asked, if you are not guilty, then why did the police arrest you? The recent June 2022 mass convictions of the 51 politicians and human rights defenders also appeared to be based on fundamentally unsound evidentiary basis, and with reports that there was no clear links made between the evidence presented by the prosecution, each individual defendant, and each element of the charges. Deficient aspects of judicial investigations should be subject to correction by trial courts. However, this really, if ever, occurs. Investigations into instances of torture and ill treatment of criminal suspects are rarely ordered in contravention of Cambodia's legal obligations. In the face of these difficulties, lawyers have little recourse with complaints of judicial misconduct really succeeding. Recent cases involving human rights defenders and political opponents that the International Commission of Jurists has observed have continued to raise serious concerns of the judiciary's adherence to the right to a fair trial. These cases include the conviction of activists from Mother Nature for incitement under Articles 494 and 495 of the Criminal Code in May 2021, and the conviction of Kong Raya, a youth activist formerly affiliated with the CNRP, also under Articles 494 and 495 in June 2020. A second aspect of the rule of law crisis in Cambodia is the rampant culture of impunity in relation to gross human rights violations perpetrated in the country. The political and human rights history of modern Cambodia is largely a story of impunity. Human Rights Watch estimated that over 300 people have been unlawfully killed with impunity in politically motivated attacks since the Paris 1991 agreements. Recently, a French court issued arrest warrants for two senior Cambodian generals alleged to be responsible for the grenade attack on an opposition political rally in Phnom Penh in March 1997 that killed 16 people and injured more than 150. The Cambodian government has failed to take action against those responsible for the grenade attack, despite there being evidence allegedly linking the prime minister and his generals to the attack. This pattern of impunity, with human rights violations not being investigated effectively by an independent and impartial body, has con continued to play out repeatedly even in recent years. Perpetrators of gross human rights violations are held to account if and only if the government decides it is expedient to do so, which is to say almost never. It is, as it is almost always the case that the perpetrators of such crimes are members of or somehow linked to the government itself. The lack of accountability in Cambodia is inextricably linked to the government's control of the judiciary. An emblematic case of the use of the courts to ensure impunity is the killing of prominent political commentator Kem Lay who was killed against a backdrop of escalating attacks on civil society and the political opposition and Cambodia's well-documented history of killings, which are alleged to have had state involvement. Kem Le was shot in a cafe at a petrol station 
in central Phnom Penh on 10 July 2016. The police quickly arrested a man, Ut Ang, as he fled the scene. According to the police, the suspect later confessed to the killing, claiming that his motive was an unpaid debt Kem Lay owed him, a claim disputed by Kem Lay's widow. It was also disputed by the wife of Ut Ang. On 23 March 2017, after only a half a day hearing, which the International Commission of Jurists observed, the Phnom Penh Municipal Court found Ut Ang guilty of the murder of Kem Lay and sentenced him to life imprisonment. However, the trial left unanswered many questions about the investigation, which appears to have been seriously deficient. Until today, there has been no independent, impartial or effective investigation to establish whether anyone else was involved in the killing. On 24 May 2019, Cambodia's Supreme Court rejected Ut Ang's appeal for reduction of sentence and upheld his life imprisonment term. The failure to address such deficiencies raises concerns about prosecutors' priorities to secure a quick conviction rather than comprehensively investigate the case, including uncovering information about other possible conspirators who may have been involved. As of today, the Cambodian authorities have still failed to create an independent commission of inquiry or similar independent authority tasked with conducting an independent, impartial and effective investigation into Ken Lay's death, despite repeated calls from civil society on the matter. A more recent case is the killing of Sin Con on 21 November 2021. Sincom was affiliated with the CNRP, and a suspect was quickly arrested and confessed. The Cambodian government has asserted that the authorities have investigated the crime thoroughly and that a suspect has been apprehended. According to the Phnom Penh Municipal Military Police, the suspect admitted that he had attacked the victim because he was allegedly angry with him for previously threatening to beat him and his elder brother. However, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, OHCHR, has expressed concern over the inconsistencies between the official version of events offered by the authorities and information received by their office. They called for an independent and impartial investigation into the crime. And this call was also made by the UN Human Rights Committee in its concluding observations following its review of Cambodia on its compliance with the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. It remains to be seen whether there will be a thorough, independent and effective investigation into the suspicious circumstances surrounding Sin Con's death. But the ICJ is gravely concerned that this pattern of impunity and lack of accountability that it has observed in other politicized trials will recur in this case. These two cases are just two examples of the numerous cases of the lack of accountability for gross violations of human rights in the country, many of which involve human rights defenders and perceived political opponents of the government. They demonstrate the government's intolerance towards dissent and opposition, which has also been evinced by its concerted efforts to shrink the space for free expression and information, particularly in the digital sphere in recent years. The rule of law is not only about passing and implementing laws, but rather ensuring they are adopted and applied in accordance with international human rights law and without discrimination, including discrimination based on political or other opinion. The rule of law and human rights are inextricably intertwined. There is no rule of law within societies if human rights are not protected, and human rights cannot be protected in societies without a strong rule of law. In 2019, the Human Rights Council adopted a resolution 42 bar 37, urging the government of Cambodia to make continuous efforts to ensure that the right to freedom of expression, peaceful assembly and association, and an environment conducive to the conduct of political activities 
by all political parties under democratic principles and the rule of law. Unfortunately, in recent years, the Cambodian authorities have continued adopting and subsequently enforcing laws that are patently incompatible with its human rights obligations, especially the right to freedom of expression and information in a concerted effort to muzzle dissent and shrink civic space. An emblematic example of a fatally flawed law is the National Internet Gateway Subdecree promulgated by the Cambodian government on 16 February 2021. The subdecree requires all internet traffic to be routed through a regulatory body charged with monitoring online activity before it reaches users. Article 6 of the subdecree empowers operators to block and disconnect all network connections or content deemed to affect safety, national revenue, social order, dignity, culture, traditions, and customs in collaboration with the Ministry of Post and Telecommunication, Telecommunication Regulator of Cambodia, and other responsible authorities. These provisions are likely to be used to arbitrarily interfere with the rights to freedom of expression and information and right to privacy in a manner incompatible with the principles of legitimate purpose, legality, necessity, and proportionality under international human rights law. The powers vested to executive bodies also raises serious concerns of state overreach without adequate independent oversight, in spite of the requirement under human rights law that content regulation in digital spaces must be undertaken pursuant to an order by an independent and impartial judicial authority. The Cambodian authorities have invoked laws that are not human rights compliant to target and sanction social media users, human rights defenders, journalists, media platforms, women and perceived political opponents in violation of the rights to online freedom of expression and information, privacy, peaceful assembly, health, fair trial and non-discrimination. Efforts to shrink online civic space have intensified, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic as the state attempted to suppress any criticism and dissent towards its mismanagement response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Besides the National Internet Gateway Subdecree, other examples of new flawed laws that were passed in response to the COVID-19 pandemic include the law on the management of the nation in emergencies and law on preventative measures against the spread of COVID-19 and other severe and dangerous contagious diseases. These vague and overbroad laws have been applied to restrict expression related to the COVID-19 pandemic under an overly expansive justification of curbing false information in order to protect public health. For instance, it was reported in April 2021 that TikTok users had been arrested and charged under the COVID-19 preventative law for spreading allegedly false information about COVID-19 vaccines. In July 2021, Reporters Without Borders reported that Cal Pisep, a journalist, could potentially face up to five years in prison under the same law for making comments about COVID-19 vaccines. Journalists and media platforms have also been targeted and sanctioned for their reporting on the COVID-19 pandemic, which stands to arbitrarily undermine the crucial role of the media in monitoring the operation of and facilitating accountability in health systems. At least five media outlets have had their media licenses revoked by the Cambodian government for their reporting on the COVID-19 pandemic. And these decisions do not appear to be subject to independent judicial review. Judicial review of executive actions that undermine human rights is a cornerstone of the rule of law. The ICJ also documented at least three journalists who faced arbitrary legal charges in relation to their online reporting on the COVID-19 pandemic under vague charges of incitement and obstructing enforcement measures under the COVID-19 preventative law. In conclusion, the above is really just a brief overview of only three of the many pressing laws, policies and practices that seriously undermine the rule of law in Cambodia.
perpetrators of gross human rights violations, including state actors and those affiliated with the state, continue to enjoy impunity, while victims, especially the most vulnerable and marginalized, remain without effective remedies and reparations. Impunity and lack of redress dehumanizes victims and acts as an impediment to the cementing of democratic values and the rule of law. Serious legal reform of institutions, particularly the judiciary, and legal frameworks that are not compliant with human rights law and standards is long overdue. Unfortunately, the emblematic cases we have highlighted rep represent just a fraction of the widespread human rights violations that continue to plague Cambodia. And it is the hope of the International Commission of Jurists that this commission of inquiry will provide the chance to victims and their representatives to tell their stories and to demand justice and accountability. Thank you, Mr. Abbott, for your statement. The international rule of law standards that you have just explained take on special significance in the context of long-standing and systemic abuses that the Hun Sen government has been carrying out in Cambodia for many years. With Kingsley Abbott's explanations of international rule of law standards in mind, here are a few special points that need to be made related to Hun Sen's rule of law violations. These are the main takeaway points that you should focus on related to the Hun Sen government's rule of law abuses. First, the Hun Sen government claimed that for the United Nations Human Rights Committee in their March 2022 compliance review session that the arrests, criminal prosecutions, and long-term imprisonments of members of the political opposition and critics of the government should be treated as consistent with rule of law standards because they occurred using court processes and applying provisions of the criminal law statutes. This argument was rejected. The UN made it clear that the rule of law requirements are not satisfied by using the cloak of the courts to, and the law to try to justify the core violations of international human rights standards. Major human rights abuses cannot be justified or excused simply by hiding behind a politically controlled judicial process. Rule of law means more than just using the legal system as a basis for violating essential rights. Second, the Hun Sen government's long-standing campaign of repression must be recognized as being completely inconsistent with the rule of law standards because it violates numerous provisions of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and many other universally recognized international human rights standards and instruments. The fact that these violations, such as the closing down of the main political opposition party, are carried out with the help of the government, controlled courts, and judges does not convert these violations into lawful actions. The shutting down of major independent media outlets, the mass criminal trial of leaders of the political opposition and other critics of the government, the widespread arrests, criminal prosecutions, and brutal attacks on those who speak out against the government and all of its policies. All of these major human rights abuses must be recognized for what they really are, gross violations of international rule of law standards. Third, a key element of international rule of law principles is accountability. That means that those government officials responsible for major abuses have to be held responsible for their violations. The pursuit of accountability for Hun Sen's government practices has already started, with a determination just a few months ago by a French criminal court that there is substantial enough evidence to bring criminal charges against Hun Sen and the principal leaders of his bodyguard, his personal bodyguard unit in relation to the 1997 grenade attack on a rally of the main political opposition party that killed 16 participants and wounded many more. Based on the on-site investigative findings by the U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigations team, the French court found that Hun Sen and his top generals helped to plan the attack, facilitated entry to the rally by, throwing, by the grenade throwers, and then facilitated their escape, even housing them in the personal bodyguards unit military barracks. The French court scheduled a criminal trial of the two military generals heeding, heading Hun Sen's personal bodyguard unit at that time, but was unable to file charges against Hun Sen because he enjoys what the courts refer to as head of state immunity while he remains in the office as prime minister. Nothing better exemplifies and explains the severity and widespread nature of the rule of law violations taking place under the Hun Sen government than the decision of the mass criminal trial court that was delivered on the 14th of February, condemning the lead defendant in the case, Thierry Sang, to six years imprisonment for conspiring to commit treason and encouraging civil unrest for expressing her views critical of the government on Facebook. 
We, deep, we deeply regret that Thierry Sang and the other 138 defendants in the mass criminal trial have been subjected to this persecution and are being unjustly imprisoned for the political reasons as a result. We hope that the international community will rise up with universal and forceful objections and condemnations of these extremely serious rule of law violations. Just two days before her arrest and imprisonment, Thierry was able to provide her testimony to the Commission of Inquiry for Cambodia that identified the very clearest and most dramatic terms of why the mass criminal trial is unlawful and violates a wide range of rule of law and international human rights standards. Listen carefully to Thierry's last words delivered before her arrest and imprisonment. They tell a story of why the mass criminal trial acted unlawfully in very concrete terms. Thierry identified many of the specific international law standards that the Hun Sen government has violated as a part of its effort to eliminate political opposition so as to remain in power beyond its current 37 years without meaningful public criticism and civil society activities that might threaten Hun Sen's ability to stay in office. Among the major rule of law and human rights abuses she describes in the way the mass criminal trials have taken place are failure to maintain independence of the court from political influence and control. From start to finish, the mass criminal trial was designed to punish and repress the political opposition. That was a politically motivated purpose inconsistent with the principle of the independence of the courts from government control. Extensive due process violations that made a fair trial impossible, including failing to provide defendants with proper notice of the proceedings, not providing adequate information on the charges that were made, and not allowing them to be effectively represented by the counsel of their choosing. The mass nature of the proceedings and then the fact that many were conducted on an in absentia basis contributed to the due process abuses. Violations of basic human rights protections, such as freedom of expression and freedom of association, that were especially targeted for pr criminal prosecution as a part of a campaign to control and suppress civil society activities. And discriminatory application of criminal laws, with prosecutions targeted especially targeted on leaders and members of the leading political opposition party. As the United Nations Human Rights Committee noted at their hearing on Cambodia just a few months ago on March 9th through the 11th, the Hun Sen government has weaponized its judicial and law enforcement systems to suppress the political opposition and other critics of the government. We hope this latest example of serious rule of law abuses will produce an international reaction that will force the Hun Sen government to reevaluate and overturn Thierry Singh and the other defendants' conviction and imprisonment and end these politically motivated prosecutions and imprisonments on a more general basis. Greetings from Phnom Penh or near Phnom Penh, Cambodia, from my home. My name is Thierry Singh, and it is my deep pleasure to be a part of to testify before the Commission of Inquiry on Cambodia. I am one of 139 individuals being tried for conspiracy to commit treason and incitement to social unrest in this unprecedented mass criminal trial that is ongoing here in Cambodia. So as I testify, um, now, I'm living under this cloud of prosecutions, of criminal prosecutions by this autocratic regime. I am a political activist, but in recent months, oh, these, uh, this cr massive criminal trial has turned me into a political actress. The mass criminal trial, or the mass trial, to, <laughs> uh, was initiated in... 2019, upon knowledge, upon public knowledge, that the opposition leader, Sam Ranzi, would be returning to Cambodia or is planning to return to Cambodia. And the mass trial had its first initial hearing in November 2020, where I was present in the courtroom along with some 40 other charged individuals among the 139 individuals. National rule of law standards are clear and must be applied to the mass criminal trial circumstances. These standards were voluntarily accepted by the Hun Sen regime. No one forced it on them. 
and form a core of Cambodian law. As you know, due process is very much synonymous with rule of law and forms a, 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 um, the basic standard of rule of law. Um, and due process is concerned with procedure, fairness, and application. From the very beginning of these proceedings, this regime has violated our due process rights. Under the law, under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which from now on I'll just simply say the law on civil and political rights, a law of Cambodia, we have the right to be informed promptly of the nature and cause of the charges against us. This includes both the law and the facts on which the charges are based. However, I have been denied the latter information. I'm sure the others have been also. None of the documents that the regime has provided to me, the evidence is only a total of nine one-sided pages of printout of um, alleged um, Facebook post that they said I made, um, and that's the evidence, have identified, so none, none of these documents, the evidence, have identified or reported on any specific action that I took that were allegedly criminal. Again, I'm certain the others are in the same situation. Rather, the documents simply allege in a conclusory manner without providing a single specific example that I used the internet to appeal to the Cambodian people and the armed services to violently overthrow the legitimate government. In short, given these documents were not, given these documents were required to disclose any and all evidence that will be presented against me and the others in this proceedings and instead included unsubstantiated and vague allegations, this court should immediately, the court, the, the proceedings, the prosecutions should immediately be dismissed. We also have the right under the Cambodian law, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which is a part of Cambodian law, to have adequate time and facilities to prepare our defense. However, without knowing the factual basis of the charges against us, due to lack of access for me to my case file, for the others, they're in pre-trial pre detention with one lawyer representing some 60 individuals. However, without knowing the factual basis of the charges against us due to lack of access for me to my case file, I we have been unable to prepare any defense whatsoever. And for me, until January 2022, when I was forced to have to hire my own my lawyer, um, did then uh, I, um, I have uh, access to my case file. We also have the right under Cambodian law, which is also under the law on civil and political rights, to examine witnesses against us and to obtain attendance and examination of witnesses we might present on our behalf. For a long time for me, until January 2022, um, actually, I could not be prepared to uh, cross-examine any witnesses um, against me because I didn't know the factual basis of the allegations. Um, for example, I was puzzled during the trial hearing over the summons for me to appear and then its cancellation order that was allegedly issued in November 2019. But remember, I didn't know about the proceeding until 
November 29 and 2020, one year later, and I'm certain the others are in a worse situation than I meant than my uh, than than me. Um, so I'm puzzled. So there was a summons to appear and then it's cancellation order for me. Um, and there's a disconnect there. Um, but as it turns out, during the time that they, the regime accused me of fleeing justice, I was in Tromso, Norway for a human rights seminar hosted by the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I publicly documented my journey, which was about a week long, to and from Cambodia and, and, and Norway. So um, the, the absurdity that I fled justice when I documented publicly my whereabouts all the time and the irony that it should be a human rights seminar that I attended in Norway. Just an example of the absurdity of, of the violations. <clears throat> Finally, under the law on civil and political rights, a law of Cambodia, in the determination of any criminal charge against us, we have the right to a fair and public hearing by a competent, independent, and impartial tribunal established by law. As noted before, there has been no specific evidence provided to us by the court, prosecutor, or any other authority to support the charges being brought against us. We were entitled to receive any and all such evidence in advance of the trial to enable us to adequately prepare a defense and to identify and prepare witnesses that we could offer in our own defense. As such, it was made clear throughout these proceedings um, that have already um, finished for me, but not for um, other charged individuals, that either the panel of judges is incompetent or that it has acted in a manner that is not independent or impartial, again, in violation of basic rule of law or due process standards. Um, in my case, it goes against the grain of reason and the principles of justice that Article 256 of the Criminal Procedural Code of Cambodia be used to erase all small and gross violations alike just because the closing order, we're in a French um, civil system here now, the closing order has become final and definitive. Hi, my name is Kate Rosenstengel. I am a legal intern with the commission and I'm a law student at Columbia Law School. Thank you to Thierry for her testimony. Thierry has shown us a new model that we must take to challenge the legality of the Hun Science government's actions and to demand effective change. She shows that this mass criminal trial does not stand alone and is part of a much broader range of major human rights and rule of law violations committed by the government over the years and that we must no longer be silent victims of abuse. Here to speak about these abuses is Um Saman. Um Saman is a former Cambodian member of parliament and political opposition lawmaker who was arrested for two years and four months in 2017 for making a Facebook post that the government had ceded territory to Vietnam by using improperly demarcated maps. On the day of Thierry Seng's arrest, Um Saman, along with many other opposition leaders, received a court sentence to be jailed for eight years. We will also hear from Kolvat Sam, a Cambodian political opposition leader from the Ottawa, Canada chapter and member of the Democracy Supporter Association focused on media rights and freedom of expression. Kolvat Sam will be speaking on the Great Firewall Decree. These next sets of testimonies from the Cambodian community will help demonstrate how the mass criminal trial connects to a much broader range of human rights and rule of law abuses that we need to pay attention to. Please welcome Um Sum An and Kolvat Song. Hello, I'm Um Sum An, a member of Parliament of Opposition Party in Cambodia. At the United Nations Human Rights Committee's review session on Cambodia on March 9, 11, 
heavy emphasis and criticism properly was placed on action of the Hun Sen government that have eliminated core elements of democracy over the past several years. Among the government imposed restrictions that drew the most concern were one, the principal and only effective opposition political party was declared illegal and forced to the ban by a court decision that was detected by the government for political purposes. Two, the government also forced its court to convene a politically motivated mass criminal trial that still is taking place, imposing major jail sentences on over 130 leaders and members of the political opposition under weekly worded statute prohibiting action that might incite social unrest. Three, independent media outlet they reported on activities critical of the government's policy and action were forced to close or give control to the government. Four, critics of the government were jailed, beaten, or in the case of youth leader Sinkon, assassinated. Five, civil society group were monitored, silent, and in the case of the leading environmental group, Mother Nature, forced to close its operation when its such principal staffers were arrested. The United Nations correctly labeled this action as totally inconsistent with the principle of democracy that the Paris Peace Accord established for Cambodia, and that the Hun Sen government specifically agreed to follow. The Hun Sen government claimed in its defense that it was free to determine its own election system, and that the people of Cambodia had freely chosen a one-party state. The chair of the government's delegation claimed that if people prefer a one-party state that constitute democracy, the United Nations rejected those claims. Human Rights Committee member Christopher Buchan Gujana pointed out that at least 40% of the Cambodian electorate had voted in support of the opposition uh, political party in the two national elections that took place before that party was declared illegal for the most recent 2018 election. Eliminating the political opposition, he concluded, is not what democracy means and constitute a clear violation of Article 25 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which guarantee every citizen the rights and opportunity to vote and to select their representatives without restriction. Ending the United Nations Cambodia Review Session on 11 March, the chair of the Human Rights Committee, Botini Pazazis, Greece, said, the government needs to understand the concept of pluralism that allows for free discussion and disagreement with the government, including the rights of free assembly and free expression, even when governments position are criticized. She concluded that the restriction that the government has imposed on political activity and on freedom of expression 
are not consistent with the civil and political rights convenience and are not in accord with international standards. Applying this finding to the upcoming national election that will be taking place in Cambodia in 2023 provides clear guidance to the Khmer people and voters and to the international community more generally about how the election should be treated. Unless the now outlaw major opposition political party is allowed to participate in the electoral process and in the balloting in a fair and effective way, the election should be boycotted and its result not accepted by the voters of Cambodia or by the international community of nations. A fair and close election is not valid or consistent with international standard. A one-party state created by eliminating the political opposition and by severely uh, restricting free expression and criticism of the government is not democracy, despite what the Hun Sen government claimed before the Human Rights Committee. No fair election means no vote and non recognition of the free race reserve is the only rational approach to take by voter and by the international community. Taking a cue from China and using the Chinese Great Firewall as a model, on February 16, 2022, Hun Sen adopted a degree establishing the National Internet Gateway, NIG, to monitor and control all internet and social media activity in the country through a government, government control, network of blocking and censorship device, designed to review and regulate all online communication. The degree give government authority power to monitor, prevent, and disconnect all forms of, of internet use and content for the purpose of protecting national security and maintain social order. Dozens of local and international human rights groups, as well as the United Nations Human Rights Committee, at its February review session on Cambodia, have condemned the plan as grave threat to free speech and privacy on the internet, noting that the extensive online monitoring system would allow for the collection, retention, and misuse of personal user data in a way that fundamentally threaten the right to privacy, freedom of expression and information. Human Rights Watch note that it's not coincident that after shutting down critical media across the country, the Hun Sen government has now turned its attention to control online communication just in the time for the 2022-2023 election. In addition, local human rights and democracy group have said the new gateway will give the former Khmer Rouge cut yet more way to silent opposition voice. The completion of the gateway now could allow the government to block dissenting view online in the run up to poll. Social media critic of Hun Sen, government have been subject to persecution through arrest and imprisonment for some time. Among those jailed for expression their view online, who case demonstrate the direction that the government internet censorship effort, effort are like to take under a new degree are these following. One, 
Mitch Heng was one of the Cambodian refugee who was recently deported back to Cambodia at the request of the Hun Sen government, arrested on his arrival and charged with incitement to commit felony and insulting the king for his social media posted critical of the government restriction on civil and political activity. 2. Kia Sukun, a well-known youth rapper, was sentenced to 18 months in prison for posting two songs on YouTube with lyrics that oppose oppression and displacement of Cambodian from their land. 3. So Wan Chai, a teenager, was arrested and jailed for posting protest message on the Telegram platform that insult the government officer. 4. Vuen Visna was arrested for posting a poem on Facebook critical of Hun Sen. His later, his later fled to Thailand and was given a refugee status by the United Nations before being forcibly, forcibly returned to Cambodia at the request again of the Cambodian government. 5. Sambo Peter, a journalist with a now closed down Cambodian daily, was charged with a crime of citing social unrest for opposing new article during the 2018 local and national election that report on government restriction against political activity. These are just a few examples of how the Hun Sen government has applied criminal sanction on those expressing their view on social media. The new and more comprehensive degree regulating internet use, more general raise the level of government monitoring and censorship to new high, mirroring the comprehensive control that the government of China has imposed across a broad range of internet and social media used for many years in order to squash decent and preventing critical communication. A particular concern is the broad and very vaguely word nature of the language of the new degree, imposing harsh criminal penalty for any internet user use or communication that the government deem a threat to social order and or national security. At its Cambodian review session in February, the United Nations Human Rights Committee expressed particular criticism of widely word status along this line that give the government would, uh, unfettered discretion to impose criminal penalty on any form of freedom of expression that you as a criticism and or an addition of political opposition. My name is Samuel Sontag. I'm the legal assistant for the Commission of Inquiry for Cambodia and a law student at Columbia Law School. Uh, thank you to Um Sam An and Kovat Tom for your powerful testimonies. Now we will hear from longtime uh, and former Asia Director for Human Rights Watch, Brad Adams. Uh, Mr. Adams has done critical work monitoring and reporting on a wide range of human rights and rule of law abuses in Cambodia. Um, please welcome Mr. Adams. Those were very powerful testimonies from uh, Cambodians who were affected directly and indirectly by this horrific grenade attack. Um, Earlier this year, there was a very important development in the grenade attack case, which many people thought um, would just be another example of permanent impunity for Hun Sen and the generals and others who have carried out violence against so many Cambodians over the years. On December 30th, 2021, a French court issued arrest warrants for two senior Cambodian generals for the grenade attack which took place on March 30, 1997, and killed 16 people and injured more than 150. The court order states that a summons was issued for Prime Minister Hun Sen for his role in the attack, but that the French government blocked its delivery, citing the fact that 
Hun Sen was the head of the Cambodian government. The judge, Sabine Karras, is vice president of investigations of the Tri Tribunal Judiciaire de Paris, the Judicial Court of Paris, and it stated that arrest warrants had been issued on March 19, 2020, so more than two years ago, against General Hoi Pisset, who was chief of Prime Minister Hun Sen's bodyguard unit on March 30, 1997, and General Hing Bun Hieng, who's the very notorious henchman of Hun Sen, who has been responsible for a wide variety of human rights abuses over the years. He was the deputy chief of the unit at the time. And they were um, indicted and um, have been issued arrest warrants for their role in planning and orchestrating the attack. Now, the Cambodian government has never taken action against those responsible for uh, the grenade attack on Sam Ramsey and his supporters even though there is substantial evidence that Hun Sen and his generals are behind the atrocity. And of course, the reason they haven't taken action is because the evidence would lead to Hun Sen and the people closest to him. Uh, we're calling on, and, and others have called on the French government after these arrest warrants were issued, to request a European arrest warrant, which means that if uh, either Hoi Pisset or Hing Bun Hing stepped foot in any European Union country, they would be subject to arrest and an Interpol red notice, um, which would mean that um, any country um, in which they traveled that is a party to the Interpol system, which is almost all countries in the world, would have an obligation to arrest them and, and turn them over to France for prosecution. Um, now, this case is unusual in, in that Sam Ranzi is a French citizen, so he could sue in a French court um, both on criminal and civil charges. Uh, and the French uh, court had to act because of his citizenship of France. Um, now, Hun Sen and, and some people have often said that Sam Renzi wasn't even present when the grenades were thrown. That's not true. Um, he was injured in the leg. I was there that day uh, and I saw the injury to Sam Renzi. It was a, a relatively minor wound to his shin, but nonetheless, he was hit by fragments. Uh, in the case in Paris, I testified in 2015, and I presented uh, direct evidence because I've interviewed many, many people um, who uh, were present at the attack when I was working for the United Nations back in 1997. And I've interviewed a lot of Cambodian government officials, many of whom said that Hun Sen was the person who ordered this attack. Um, so I'll just read part of the judge's order, the French judge's order. It says, it appears from the information received that Hoi Pisset and Hing Bud Hing, chief and deputy chief of the prime minister's special bodyguards, organized and carried out the grenade attack on March 30, 1997 in Phnom Penh, with Sam Ranzi as the target. Hoi Pisset deployed his men, heavily armed and in combat gear. Instructions were given to the men to position themselves in a line at a reasonable distance behind the demonstrators to facilitate the retreat of the grenade throwers to the CPP military compound and to prevent anyone from pursuing them. Hing Bun Hing recruited men to carry out the attack. Hun Sen's bodyguard, the 2nd Battalion of the 17th Regiment, and actually this is a mistake, I think it's the 70th, but is commanded solely by Hun Sen, the prime minister himself, or by Hui Pisset. Hui Pisset told the FBI that he received a deployment order from the prime minister's office. In fact, he's made several statements to that effect. So, I mean, the French court was very clear on who they say is responsible for the attack. Hun Sen, Hui Pisset, and Hing Bun Hing. Arrest warrants were issued for Hui Pisset and Hing Bun Hing. They were not... It was not issued for Hun Sen because of Hun Sen's position as head of government, which gives him some form of immunity. The court noted the, quote, the lack of cooperation of the Cambodian authorities throughout this judicial investigation. This, the court said, is despite the fact that Cambodia has cooperated with the French justice system in a murder case involving a French family in Cambodia. So the court said that not only was Hun Sen um, responsible, but that his, he and his government refused to cooperate. Now, uh, the judge actually tried to compel Hun Sen to appear. On February 10, 2017, 
Judge Karras issued a summons to Hun Sen to appear in court. But in August of 2017, about six months later, the French Ministry, and this is what she says in her order, the French Ministry for Europe and Foreign Affairs informed the judge that Hun Sen, in his capacity as head of the government of the Kingdom of Cambodia, held absolute immunity from jurisdiction, which prevented him from being tried in France and from being subjected to any measure of constraint, such as a summons to appear for possible indictment. And I think it's, so I think it's fair to conclude that without immunity, Hun Sen would also be facing indictment in France uh, for this really horrific attack. Um, I just want to tell you what I saw and what people who were there saw um, on the attack. We saw the bodyguard unit in full riot gear present at the demonstration. Now, this was the first time they ever appeared at a demonstration. Previously, even banned demonstrations were met with a police presence, not the bodyguard and not members of the military. And many witnesses reported to me and others that the people who threw the grenades uh, afterwards ran towards Hun Sen's bodyguards for protection. The bodyguards were deployed in a line at the west end of the park in front of the residential compound that people often refer to um, as the CPP compound, because that's where Hun Sen, Heng Sem Rin, and many other senior uh, CPP leaders have had houses. Witnesses told the UN and FBI that the bodyguards allowed the assailants to escape into the compound, where presumably they were protected and then left with protection. The bodyguards actually even stopped people in the crowd who were chasing after the grenade throwers at gunpoint from chasing them any further, threatening to kill them. Now, the other thing that is very interesting is that the police, who had previously maintained a high profile at opposition demonstrations, were not present when the grenades went off. A large contingent of police was around the corner. Um, other police units were in a nearby police station in full riot gear on high alert. This all suggests that they knew there would be violence and they were told to stay away uh, until afterwards. Um, in a June 1997 interview with the Phnom Penh Post, Hing Bun Hing threatened to kill journalists who said that he had ordered this or participated in it or that Hun Sen's bodyguards were involved. He repeated this kind of language when news came out about the arrest warrants from France earlier this year. Uh, and what's really disturbing about uh, the situation afterwards is that Hun Sen has promoted Hing Bun Hing. Uh, and, and many others over the years who have committed serious human rights abuses. And, um, and, and this just shows the extent of the impunity that, um, that Hun Sen and the people around him have. I also mentioned that in uh, 1997, um, the uh, State Department publishes an annual report. It characterized the attack as a terrorist attack. So this wasn't just murder and attempted murder. According to the United States government, this was an act of terrorism. So um, even though the French court didn't use that term, uh, the United States government has called it terrorism. Uh, it's also worth noting that the uh, Washington Post published a front page story in 1997 saying that, um, quote, in a classified report, the FBI tentatively pinned responsibility for the blasts and the subsequent interference with the investigation on personal bodyguard forces employed by Hun Sen, according to four U.S. government sources familiar with the report's contents. The agents involved reportedly have complained that additional informants um, in Cambodia are too frightened to come forward. So the U.S. had concluded that Hun Sen was behind it um, and that uh, the Cambodian authorities were threatening witnesses to try to stop them from giving testimony. Um, so, you know, what are the you know what are the prospects for this case? What we have now is um, a French arrest warrant for two very senior Cambodian generals. Uh, they should be arrested if they land on European soil. They should be arrested if they travel internationally and they should be brought to Paris to stand trial. Um, this is a case where um, justice um, has been greatly delayed, but we're starting to see that justice can't be permanently denied.
I think that this case um, sends a message, an important message to uh, Hun Sen and his henchmen that um, people will not forget uh, the serious human rights abuses they've committed, you know, back to the 1980s with the Ka Prom uh, 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 killings of the Thai border um, with the violence during UNTAC, the grenade attack, the violence during the July 1997 coup, all the killings in the 1998 elections and subsequent elections, killings of environmental activists, journalists, members of parliament, including my friend Om Ratsadi, who was killed um, by CPP thugs. Um, these cases will are being remembered, um, and there can be venues in which they can be prosecuted. Uh, so I think it's important in this French case shows that we will not give up the fight against impunity and for justice. Uh, and I expect uh, at some point, both Hoi Pisset and Hing Bun Hing to end up in a French court. The next thing that will happen in this case is that the case will go to trial, I'm told next year in 2023, with or without Hing Bun Hing and Hoi Pisset. Obviously, our goal is for both of them to stand trial in court, to receive a fair trial. They can present uh, witnesses in defense. They will have their own counsel. Um, and for the facts to come out and for a French court to judge them impartially. And I believe if a French court does that, they will be found guilty. Mr. Adams, thank you for your statement. So the French court's indictment addresses the 1997 grenade attack. Um, but might national courts outside of Cambodia address other human rights abuses by the Hun Sen government? Uh, and specifically, how might the principle of universal jurisdiction be used uh, to hold Hun Sen and his government to account for their human rights abuses? The case uh, in Paris is a case of a French citizen bringing a case in a French court. Uh, that will not be available to non-French citizens. However, there is a principle called universal jurisdiction, which can be quite valuable. Universal jurisdiction um, is where a country has passed a law saying that they're going to uphold international human rights law, uh, despite the fact that the victim and the perpetrator and even the location of the crime were in another country. Um, and in fam some famous examples are, for instance, uh, people who have committed murder or torture as part of a military regime or a dictatorship. Um, but then one of the people involved in the human rights abuse travels to a country with a universal jurisdiction law, and then they are subject to arrest. Um, the problem is, the challenge is, is that we often don't know when someone is going to travel. So these cases have to be prepared in advance uh, in, in countries where there are universal jurisdiction statutes. This means that all the evidence necessary to file a criminal case need to be prepared. That involves witnesses, documents, and other evidence. The evidence has to be presented to a prosecutor in a country with a universal jurisdiction law. And for instance, Germany has one, Belgium has had one, Spain has had one, Argentina has one right now, um, where they are filing cases um, for uh, against Burmese officials who have committed serious crimes against the Rohingya. Um, and then you have to wait until this official, this perpetrator, travels to the country. Now, this is complicated, but it has worked in a number of cases, um, and including some high profile cases, including a senior general in Uzbekistan who was responsible for torture, a senior Syrian military official who was responsible for killings, and others. And we do know that a lot of senior Cambodian officials who are responsible for human rights abuses, travel a lot. Many of them have 
overseas assets and property. They have family that they visit. I mean, for example, we have uh, photos of Net Savun, um, you know, visiting his family in London. Uh, and you know, Net Savun is a notorious human rights abuser. And if we had had a, pre a case prepared, or if if victims um, had worked with lawyers and human rights uh, workers to prepare a case before he arrived, he might have been subject to arrest. Uh, the UK has, for example, arrested an a, 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 an officer in the Nepal military and subjected him to trial in recent years. So universal jurisdiction offers a possibility. It's a complicated one, so I don't wanna make it sound easy, uh, but it can have results um, and it can lead to justice and accountability. The French court's order of indictment offers strong evidence of Hun Sen's bodyguards involvement in the 1997 grenade attacks. Uh, on the political opposition, but it also provides evidence that Hun Sen himself may have been directly involved. Uh, so why wasn't Hun Sen indicted? Uh, and what legal action can advocates and members of the Khmer community uh, take to hold him to account? So you may be thinking, what can we do in the Khmer community um, on the French case? And I think there are some important things that, can, that, that you can do. Uh, I don't think the French government is likely to change its mind about indicting Hun Sen uh, or issuing an arrest warrant, but I do think it would be worth engaging in um, some public advocacy on that to make it clear that even if he escapes justice, this judge's court order was quite an earthquake. Um, he, he has been named as responsible and is only protected because of his job title as head of government. Um, and it'd be important to campaign on this so that he's not invited to France. He's not invited to anywhere in the European Union, which has common standards on justice and human rights, um, and is not invited really to any other democracies. It was a shame that he was in Washington, D.C. for the summit that Biden had with ASEAN. We hope that that will never happen again. But Europe is a different story. Um, you know, a, a, an arrest warrant in France is, should be an arrest warrant in every European Union country and vice versa. So um, this is a very important time for Hun Sen to pay a price in public relations and reputation. More practically, um, I think it'd be important for the Cambodian community to be writing to the French government and asking them to confirm that they have issued a European arrest warrant, which is an arrest warrant for within all countries within the European Union. So if Hoi Pisset or Hing Bun Hing were to travel to any of those countries, they should be subject to arrest. And to ask the French government to confirm that they have issued a red notice through Interpol. Um, and Interpol is a system in which almost all countries around the world participate as a way to avoid allowing serious criminals to travel globally and avoid arrest where they have been charged. Th these are the kinds of things that the Cambodian community can campaign on. It will get media attention in France and in Europe, and it will make it much harder um, for uh, any government, the French government or any European government, to ignore uh, a, these abuses, and B, the fact that Hing Bun Hing and Hoi Piset uh, might travel someday uh, to one of these European countries. And finally, is the French court case's order of indictment binding and enforceable? Will it lead to a court proceeding where Hun Sen's generals will be called before the court for the 1997 grenade attack? I've been asked whether the French court case is binding and enforceable. Um, and some people are saying, well, so what if there's a case in France against these two generals, if there's arrest warrants? Um, and will it lead to a court proceeding? And the answer is yes. Uh, the court has said that they expect the case to go to trial in late 2023, so next year, about a year from now. Um, and the French system allows trials in absentia, which means if the person is absent. Now, that is not preferable. Um, justice is best served 
when the perpetrators, when the defendants, when the accused are in court and uh, try to defend themselves. But that's their choice. If Hing Bun Hing and Hoi said don't want to show up in France, they made a choice, and then they're going to be subject to a French court's decision. The evidence will be presented by Sam Ramsey's lawyers. That evidence includes the evidence I gave in 2015, FBI reports, United Nations reports, media reports, the reports of Human Rights Watch and other um, entities that have looked into this, that have investigated this. And if they're not present, then they will certainly lose because all the evidence will be on one side. And frankly, even if they show up, um, I don't think that there's anything they can do to rebut the evidence that we have presented because the evidence is so clear. Uh, if the court um, holds a trial and finds the defendants guilty, they will be subject to arrest um, and sentencing. And uh, the arrest warrants that are issued now will be even more important to other countries where they travel. Because it's one thing for a case to be filed. They essentially right now are subject to indictment and arrest because they didn't show up in court once they were indicted. Um, but that's different than being convicted. And so I expect that um, this court case will be binding and will be enforceable globally. Um, and that these two uh, generals will be subject to arrest if they step foot out of Cambodia, unless they go to maybe China or North Korea, where they probably would not be turned over. Uh, and um, and this is an important precedent. This is is very important. I think it's very important for people to understand that you know, justice with powerful human rights abusers moves unevenly and unpredictably. And I think many people would have said that the grenade attack was a case of permanent impunity. And I wish I could have said publicly, you know, starting in 2015, when I gave evidence that this case was alive, but the court asked for uh, me and other people who participated uh, not to speak publicly. Um, so we didn't. But um, things, things are, are, are happening often, um, just too slowly. Um, and too unpredictably um, for those of us who think that um, there should be swift justice for human rights abuses. But this is a good case to show that we should not give up hope and that things can change. Um, and here in this one case in France, we may end up having two of the most powerful generals responsible for one of the worst atrocities in Cambodia since the Khmer Rouge period uh, being finally held accountable. Thank you, Mr. Adams and Samuel. Thus far in the hearing, we've talked a lot about the extensive rule of law and human rights abuses carried out by Hun Sen's government on a systemic basis, with the mass criminal trial being just the latest example. Now that the commission has engaged in fact-finding documenting these abuses, it's time to give attention to how we attach accountability to these violations. The French criminal court decision of November 2020 marks the first important step in that process. With us to help us understand the French criminal court case and its significance for beginning the accountability process is French lawyer Jessica Fennell, who brought the case before the court and shepherded it successfully through the French judicial process. She will explain why this decision is such an important breakthrough development that will lead the way towards accountability for Hun Sein. Hi everyone, so um, I would like to speak about um, a case I've been involved in, which you probably all know about, uh, which is uh, the grenade attack case. Um, so the grenade attack case was brought before the French court thanks to uh, Sam Renzi's French nationality. Uh, as you may be aware, Renzi um, is a Cambodian nationality who also has a French nationality as well as his wife, Samura. Um, and they both brought, thanks to their French nationality because they've been a victim of the grenade attack that happened on 30 March, 1997 in Phnom Penh. Uh, while Renzi was demonstrating peacefully. Um, um, he brought the case uh, with Somura, who I think joined the case later, uh, before the French court. So they brought, um, they filed a complaint before the French court in 2000. At the time, I was not a lawyer yet, so 
um, <laughs> he had another lawyer and um, the case went on, but nothing really happened. Obviously, the Cambodian authorities would not cooperate. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the, the case was dropped at some point. Um, and in 2011, uh, thanks to the declassification of some FBI reports, the FBI had been involved in investigations on the grenade attack because one of their UN citizens had been seriously wounded, Ron Abney. Um, and so the FBI led investigations and the reports that flew that flown from uh, these investigations were declassified probably around that time. So at that point, um, Renzi wanted to have the French investigation reopened. And we cannot do that uh, in general when there is a definitive decision to drop a case or to close a case. But because there were new facts, we came back to the French courts and said, OK, actually, we have new evidence that goes to show um, that um, Hun Sen's regime uh, is, Hun Sen is actually behind the grenade attack. So we want the investigation to be reopened. So at that point, um, I, I worked on this case with uh, my boss at the time, Pierre-Olivier Sur, um, and uh, we had the case reopened. And there were a succession of three investigating judges. That's the way the French system works. We have on most, for most serious crimes, we have investigating judges who are um, investigating on behalf of both the accused and the prosecution, the defense and the prosecution, um, and the victims. Um, and so we had three investigating judges who sent some, what we call rogatory commission to uh, Cambodia to ask for investigations to be conducted there, for witnesses to be heard. And of course, the Cambodian authorities would be would refuse to cooperate. Um, but at some point, we had uh, the last judge was uh, very motivated about the case. And she was uh, determined to uh, stop impunity. And she wanted to have a trial because she was believing that there were some responsible uh, people behind it. And those responsible people were actually at the top of the government. And so she conducted some investigations. We filed a lot of documents. We filed the FBI reports. We also filed a hang of a statement, uh, which also was probably dated a, a year or two before that, who was also um, supporting uh, our, um, our arguments. And, and we also had an amazing witness, Brad Adams, who, who came and testified before the French courts. Brad Adams, at the time of the grenade attack, was um, working for the UN in Cambodia. And he was almost an eyewitness because he, he was there in the aftermath of the grenade attack. Ten minutes after, he was there on the scene. And so he saw himself a lot of things and he investigated on the case for years after. So he had a lot of material and a lot of information to give to the judge. And um, Renzi was heard as well uh, as part of this case. And at the end of her investigation, the investigating judge decided that actually there was enough evidence to, um, to charge um, Unsen personally for the crime. She thought that he was behind the grenade attack. Um, she uh, deducted from everything that she had gathered from the investigation that his, that were his, the heads of his bodyguard units, of his personal bodyguard units, who organized and implemented the attack, and that was under the direct order of Unsen. So she decided to have him charged. Uh, she sent a um, uh, summon for him to be charged through the diplomatic channel. Unfortunately, but rightly so, the French foreign uh, minister uh, refused to transmit it to a uh, uh, to, to the Cambodian government because they said that Hun Sen enjoyed uh, the privilege of immunity as a, as, a head of, as, a he, as a head of state. And therefore, uh, they refused, but this was quite uh, right in law. And so we came back to the judge and said, OK, if this is not Hun Sen, this is going to be his two, the two heads of his bodyguard unit at the time, Hing Bung Heng and Hit Tisset, uh, who, uh, who, will, uh, who are as well directly responsible for it under the order of Unsen, but having them indicted or having them charged, it's the same thing as having Unsen. And so she, uh, she, uh, she followed us. Um, arguments were quite strong. The evidence was quite strong. And she had, them, um, she had a summons sent to them directly. 
um, through the diplomatic channel to be charged before her. And because they did not appear on the hearing to be charged, she issued against them international arrest warrants. And at the end of the investigations, uh, she had to make a decision of what to do with the case. Um, the French prosecution was not supporting us. The French prosecution was quite reluctant to see this case move forward. Uh, but despite this, she issued an order to have these two generals tried before the French court for attempt of assassination of Samaranzi. Uh, yeah, of Samaranzi, sorry. Um, and so this is the order of the 30 December 2021. Uh, this order has not been appealed. It's not been appealed by the French prosecution. It's not been appealed by the defense because the defense has never responded to any summons, so they're not a party to the case and they have not appeared to appeal it. Uh, so this is a definitive order. And now there will be a trial, probably in absentia. There will be a trial which could take place um, in, a, in a year, in a, probably in two, something like two years, a year, two years, um, probably in absentia, unless the two generals are uh, arrested in the meantime. What is interesting is that, what is very compelling and interesting is that this is a very strong message which is sent to um, repressive governments in general, but to the one of Hunsen in particular, that there is no impunity. Uh, it's not because you commit a crime in Cambodia and there will be impunity in Cambodia, that there would be impunity anywhere else, everywhere else, let's say. And now any court um, in the world can actually decide to investigate on a case where when the allegations are very serious, either on the basis of the nationality of the dual nationality or the nationality of a victim or the dual nationality of a perpetrator. It happens as well often now or on the basis of universal jurisdiction. And what is interesting as well is that Hing Bung Heng in particular was promoted after the grenade attack. Uh, he was promoted by Hun Sen at the time of the grenade attack, he was the deputy head of the bodyguard unit, and and then he, he, he was promoted, and he's now still working for Hun Sen as the head of his, his, his bodyguard unit or his security forces. So this would be the trial of someone who is still very close to Hun Sen, and this is a very strong message to be passed. This is not uh, Hui Piset might be retired and he's maybe out of the picture, um, but In Bung Hem is a direct actor now of uh, of Unsen's regime and of Unsen's uh, uh, actions. So, um, yes, I, I think that's important to note that this example, this case is a very strong example of, of how um, basically this is the time where uh, you can do anything in your country because you're protected by your judicial system is over and uh, any other country can hold um, a head of state or not directly a head of state if he's still in power but close people to the head of state uh, who don't enjoy immunity and there's loads of them who don't even quite high ranked they will be uh, held accountable we have two questions for miss Fennell. first the french criminal courts has issued an indictment finding probable cause for the hunsign government's criminal responsibility for the 1997 grenade attack in freedom park how do you see this potentially changing or affecting the accountability equation? And how can it make a difference? This is, this is a very important um, step, I think, um, in terms of um, and, and ending impunity. It shows that um, if, you're a very if you're a repressive head of state like Hun Sen, uh, and you think that you're protected by your judicial system, uh, well, then you might be protected by your judicial system, but you might you 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 would not be necessarily by by others. And even though Hun Sen is enjoying immunity now, um, this will stop when he leaves power, and uh, his uh, his subordinate, but even high ranked ones, high uh, high high ranked officials working under his supervision with him, would be held accountable potentially. Uh, before foreign courts for the crimes that they committed. So it's hopefully a strong deterrent. And progressively, because now we are in an era where universal jurisdiction cases um, are uh, more and more, uh, there's more and more of them, basically, before different courts in the world. 
um, universal jurisdiction cases or cases that, that rely on the uh, foreign nationality of a victim or a perpetrator. So, for example, the grenade attack case, it relies on the French nationality of, of Renzi as a victim. But basically, in, in those cases are have been multiplied abroad and it's really progressively passing the message that you are not protected anymore for the crimes that you commit in your country, even though uh, there is a, an impunity in your country. And uh, this is, I think, a, a very strong and compelling message that accountability now exists. And there's no crime in the world that, can re that would absolutely remain unpunished. There's absolutely no more guarantee about that. And NGOs, civil society, Victims are more and more aware of this and are more and more using foreign national systems as a tool of ending impunity for crimes committed in, uh, on the land of, uh, of, uh, of countries uh, managed by repressive governments or autocrats by consent. Is the French court case's order of indictment binding and enforceable? Will it lead to a criminal... Will it lead to a court proceeding where Hun Sein's generals will be called before the court for the 1997 grenade attack? The French court's case order of indictment is definitely binding and enforceable. Um, it's a definitive decision. It was not appealed by anyone in the delay uh, of appeal. Um, the French prosecutor did not appeal it. Um, the defense, which never appeared in the case because they're ignoring uh, the indictment and the arrest warrants and everything else uh, obviously did not appeal it either. So this is a definitive order. It's binding, it's enforceable, and it will lead to a court uh, hearing where Hun Sen's general will be judged and hopefully convicted. Hello, my name is Sotia Poj, and I'm currently interim chair of the Committee for Paris Peace Accord uh, on Cambodia's Minnesota. As we move toward the Cambodian national election scheduled for mid-2023, it is important to give special attention to how the Hun Sen government's long-standing and systemic human right, the rule of law violation affects the electoral process and how the international community should approach the result of the 2023 elections. Especially over the last few years, the Hun Sen government has made eliminations of the leading political opposition party and the persecution of the leader and members, the principal focus on its campaign of abuses. The French criminal court decisions of December 30th, 2021, finding the probable cause to believe that Hun Sen and the general heading his personal bodyguard units were substantially involved with and criminally responsible for the 1997's grenade attacks on the opposition political party rallies in Freedom Park that killed 16 and wounded many more, further emphasizes the need to give in prominent attention to the upcoming election and to how the Khmer and international communities should be dealing with the coming election process. As the United Nations Human Rights Committees prominently noted at the conclusion of its compliance review hearing on Cambodia on March 11, 2022, it is impossible to consider the 2023 elections free, fair, legitimate when the main political opposition party is outlawed and eliminated from participating in the election process when its leader are arrested and forced into exile and subjected to mass criminal trial that grossly violate due process and the rule of law standard, and when all other forms of public oppositions, criticisms, and even objective reporting are repressed or eliminated by the government. An election under these conditions does not deserve to be recognized or taken seriously by international community. Given extensive nature of these problems, careful considerations need to be given to the recommendations made by Brad Adams of Human Rights Watch early on in this process, namely 
that the Khmer community totally boycott the election process as presently constituted, and that the international community refused to accept the an election's predetermined result. Consistent with that approach, substantial effort must be made to convene or to convince the foreign governments and international organizations like the United Nations to withhold official recognition of the legality of the Hun Sen government, absence major changes in the electoral process and substantial improvement in eliminating the policy of repression that make meaningful and effective political oppositions and public criticisms impossible. What are the specific steps that must be taken to bring Cambodia into compliance with the wide range of human rights and rule of law standards that are presently being violated on a widespread and increasing basis by the Hun Sen's government? And that is the key questions that we all need to be asking and demand answer for. Those steps must include at a minimum, one, all arrests and criminal prosecution of opposition political leader and members must end. And those already under criminal restraints must be freed with criminal sanctioned penalty removed, including a court order making the main opposition's political party illegal. Two, all restriction and restraint on media's outlet and civil society groups inconsistent with Cambodia obligation under international law must be lifted so that these groups can operate, exercise their free expression, association right without improper interference. Three, consistent with international rule of law standards, some form of internationally supervised or administer accountability effort must be initiated to hold, to account those responsible for the systemic abuses that has been taking place on such a widespread basis. In early 2023, the commissions of inquiries will convene a special hearing on the Cambodian electoral process to assess whether sufficient and meaningful progress has been made so as to legitimize the 2023 national election and its result. Without that significant progress, there is no reason for the election to take place or for the international community to accept their predetermined result if they are held as presently constituted. In 2023, the Commission of Inquiries also planned to be moving into an, accountable, an accountability phase recognizing that past monitoring and facts finding effort has not been sufficient to produce meaningful and effective change and improvements. We will be working with other groups to determine how to convert the substantial body of evidence of gross and systemic uh, violations of internationally recognized human rights and the rule of law standards by the Hun Sen government into a process that can work more effectively to hold Hun Sen and his principal official accountable in meaningful ways. The French criminal court decisions of December 30th will be one important model that we will use. Please join us in that expanding effort over the coming months. Thank you to Sotia Poach for your statement. We now welcome Commissioner Louisa cohen Griva for her concluding remarks. Her remarks were recorded before the mass conviction and arrest of dissidents, including Thierry Seng, on June 14th. The Commission of Inquiry for Cambodia and all international forums need to take account of these disturbing new developments in the coming weeks and months leading up to the Cambodian national election in 2023. The Commission's next hearing in early 2023 will focus on how the mass criminal trial impacts the upcoming national elections. All international forums need to do the same. The results of a national election that is held without the participation of political opposition cannot be accepted as legitimate. Foreign governments and the international community should withhold recognition of the results until a truly free and fair election can be held under international supervision. Thank you for joining this special session of the Commission of Inquiry for Cambodia on rule of law issues. 
we want to express our special appreciation to Kingsley Abbott of the International Commission of Jurists for providing us with a detailed explanation of international rule of law standards and why they are important. We also want to express our deep thanks to Brad Adams, longtime Asia Director for Human Rights Watch, and to the participating members of the Khmer community for helping us to understand how the international rule of law standards apply to the situation in Cambodia. With special importance and relevance to Cambodia and to the Khmer people are the recent developments in the French criminal court decision issued on February 2nd, which Brad Adams described. This decision makes very clear uh, in concrete terms that Prime Minister Hun Sen and his highest level officials can and will be held criminally responsible for their most serious human rights abuses. For many years, Hun Sen and his officials have been enjoying a great degree of impunity uh, and apparent freedom from being held responsible for their violations of international human rights and rule of law standards. Justice and accountability for Cambodia seemed to be a distant dream for a very long time. International human rights groups like Human Rights Watch and international agencies and officials of the United Nations would condemn the human rights and democracy violations that the Hun Sen government engaged in on a regular basis. But his government and he himself ignored these criticisms and continued to carry out uh, an increasing level of abuses. Finally, the French criminal court decision has shown us that Hun Sen's abuses are not without consequences, uh, that the world is watching, and that justice and accountability will prevail, even if it is a slow moving process. The prevailing question or concern of the Khmer community that we have come across most clearly at this rule of law session is this. Why is it taking so long for justice and accountability to take place? Why do we not see the French court decision resulting in immediate judicial action against Hun Sen? And why has it taken so long for the international community to finally give concrete enforcement attention to the longstanding and ever increasing problems in Cambodia? What we all need to recognize is that the international legal processes work slowly. International organizations and foreign governments are very reluctant to challenge the sovereign powers of other governments and their heads of state, even when their actions violate basic human rights standards. In order to force them to act and to demand justice and accountability, a number of initial steps have to take place to prime the pump, so to speak, and to make it clear to the world that major abuses of the type that the Hun Sen government has been imposing must be condemned and dealt with at the international level. It's important to realize that the process of justice and accountability is made up of a number of steps, not just the final one of bringing a human rights violator before a court of justice. A judicial proceeding with criminal charges and a finding of guilty is the last step in the process. It has to be preceded by extensive fact-finding efforts, like the ones taking place with our Commission of Inquiry, and by a long process in which the international community gathers momentum and in reinforces its willingness to take on the abuses committed by a sovereign government uh, and to tell them that they are violating international standards and that they must bear the consequences for these actions. Ensuring that the world understands the reality of what is taking place in a country to grasp the seriousness of the violations of international standards that the Hun Sen government has committed this is the important and necessary first step that has to take place before the judicial proceedings that we are all looking towards 
to produce justice and accountability. So let's not underestimate the power and impact that our fact-finding efforts will have and that our demands for justice and change will have towards this accountability process. If we help to make the world aware of the severity of the problems, uh, and if we take the actions that force the international community to act to demand change, then we are making progress towards accountability. Uh, if we are making Hun Sen himself aware that the world is watching, then we have taken an essential step in the direction of obtaining justice and accountability. All these steps are necessary parts of the accountability process, and it is not just the final court proceeding that counts. The second question that is most on the minds of the Khmer community is this. What can we do as members of the community to help speed up the process of bringing meaningful accountability and effective change to Cambodia? The simple answer to that question is, make your voice, your objections, your demands for change, your demands for accountability heard as frequently and as powerfully as possible in all the available international forums. Make clear that what is happening in Cambodia is not acceptable. That Hun Sen's claim before the United Nations on February 11th this year in 2022, that the people of Cambodia prefer and have chosen a one-party state simply is not true. It means speaking out forcefully through the Khmer Urgent Action Case Alert System to demand protection for victims uh, who have been targeted with politically motivated arrest and imprisonment. It also means boycotting tourism of Cambodia and supporting other economic sanctions against companies that are doing business with Hun Sen supported companies. Further, it means making your concerns and demands heard by the United Nations and other international agencies and officials working on Cambodia issues. In sum, it means putting pressure on the Hun Sen government at every opportunity and in every available forum. Uh, unless we mobilize as strong a voice as possible on behalf of the oppressed in Cambodia, Hun Sen's regime of harsh repression and autocratic rule will continue. That is why the work of the Commission of Inquiry for Cambodia is important and useful. And that is why your continued participation and involvement in these proceedings is helpful. It is a long and difficult journey. It is not easy and instantaneous. So we hope you will join us for our next session, which will take place at the beginning of 2023. This session will focus on the national elections being held in Cambodia in July next year. We will address uh, the following questions. How do we make it possible for meaningful and fair democratic elections to take place given the harsh campaign of repression that the Hun Sen government has been engaged in and its consistent efforts to eliminate the political opposition and indeed even the vestiges of a democratic form of governance. And if meaningful and effective political participation uh, and the exercise of internationally protected free speech and free press rights, if these are not possible in Cambodia, then what can the Khmer people do to force attention to these problems and to produce meaningful change in the electoral process? Khmers will be asking, should we vote in the upcoming elections or should we boycott it given that it is a predetermined electoral process that does not constitute a democratic choice? 
should the international community accept the results of a rigged and predetermined election, or should it deny recognition of the results of a fundamentally flawed process? These are among the key questions that we'll be focusing on at our next session, uh, and we invite you to join us then to hear our analysis and recommendations. Until then, uh, we want to encourage the Khmer community to keep up your efforts to demand justice and accountability for Cambodia and for the Khmer people. Remember, justice and accountability come in a variety of ways and through a variety of steps. You can make a difference by continuing to speak out, continuing to condemn the Hun Sen government's abuses, and continuing to demand meaningful change and accountability. Your voice matters. It has an impact and is just as strong as any court proceeding. Thank you.